We continue this week our series on 1 John entitled Recall to Fundamentals. St. John writes to the churches, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Children, it's the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Now, if this were all we had from John's letter, or from the Bible for that matter, we would probably want to leave this world as soon as possible. But what does it all mean? This is what we're going to be looking at a little bit later on in the service. Welcome. Welcome again to our service. Please join me as we pray the Colic for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let us pray for the forgiveness of our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen 
to the Word of God. Let's pray before we take a closer look at our passage today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. It seems that John is saying simply, if we're going to love God, we cannot also love the world. And again, the question, what does this all mean? First of all, we need to understand what John means by the world. Some people would see, do not love the world as a contradiction especially where elsewhere, John writes in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Shouldn't we love what God loves? Well, of course we should. Then, to complicate matters, later on in John's letter, he will write, the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Well, what does that mean? This seemingly contradiction has caused a lot of confusion over the years for Christians. No wonder there have been many differing attitudes towards the world. Sometimes in church history, there has been an emphasis upon withdrawal from contact with the world. And so the monastic movement, where people have lived behind the safety of the monastery walls, or the total opposite view, where the church has been so totally enmeshed in the world that it has been difficult to see how Christians differed in their lifestyle from the secular culture around them. The word world, or cosmos, in the original Greek language, has different meanings in the Bible. Sometimes it stands for the natural world, which God created, planet Earth. The natural world created by God is an expression of his character, his creativity, in all of its beauty and in all of its diversity. And the creation of human beings is the very apex of the created order. This is the world that God so loves. But there's also another meaning of the word world in the New Testament, and I think verse 16 describes it very well. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father but is from the world. The verse describes the desires of the flesh. Literally, it means the lust of the flesh. It points to the gratification of our bodily desires. The lust of the eyes is that strong desire for what is seen, for, for the outward form of things. It's the lust after, we would say, the superficial. The pride of life is the boasting of what a person has and does. It's a boasting arrogance, the empty haughtiness of the worldly minded. And it's very interesting to me that there is a real similarity between verse 16 here and what happened in the garden 
when Adam and Eve first disobeyed God. You remember the story way back in Genesis chapter 3. Into a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden, the tempter comes with a series of questions, which are really an attack on the character and the goodness of God. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The tempter asks. Eve answered, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, do you really have to believe what God told you? You see, the tempter is suggesting that God cannot be trusted. God's words cannot be depended on. Genesis chapter 3 highlights three stages of which Adam and Eve fell. The fruit satisfied her appetite for food. She liked the look of it, and she wanted the fruit not only to satisfy her hunger, but to make herself basically a better person. In fact, to be like God himself. The results of Adam and Eve disobeying God and listening to the lies of the tempter, the liar, are absolutely disastrous. The human race fell into sin and death. And it's exactly the same way that John highlights three elements of that temptation, I think, in verse 16. Listen to another translation of that verse. Everything the world affords, all that panders to the appetites or entices the eye, all the glamour of this life springs not from the Father, but from the godless world. In other words, take the fruit, enjoy it, you deserve it. That is how the world still attracts us into things that we should not be involved with. It's very deceptive because it insists that we live our lives basically independent from God. And it's kind of like a goldfish in a fishbowl. If the goldfish gets tired of living within the constraints of its environment and instead thinks, I'd rather live outside, it won't live very long. In the same way, when people live their lives alienated from God who created them, something inside them dies. They get tangled in the great lie of the liar. By contrast, verse 17 says, whoever does the will of God lives forever. It says this, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Amazing promise. So you see, obedience is an important part of eternal life, a vital part of it, in fact. Take a look at the next section, beginning at verse 18. Children. And there's that word of affection again to the church. Children. It is the last hour, and as you've heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. 
So John is aware that there were people in the church who he informs us have already left that had a negative impact on the church's life. They were people, we would say, people of the lie. John knew that he was involved in a battle, a real battle for truth. And we could say exactly the same thing today. We are in a battle for truth. John knew that the church must keep its guard up against falsehood. One of the clear indicators that we, what we've been talking about is, is that if the church behaves in a worldly way, it will be doomed to fail and to fall. Verse 18 mentions both the Antichrist and many Antichrists. Well, what is an Antichrist? Now, John is the only biblical author to use this term. Although Jesus had warned his followers of pseudo-Christs, he said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive the elect. One commentator says this, we may well think Jesus, or for that matter, John, were referring to what we would call a religious phenomenon. But the complex world of first century Palestine itself was full of men and movements claiming that God was acting at last in this way and in that way, through this movement and through that man. This was as much what we'd call political as what we would call religious, though in fact you couldn't get a razor blade between them in those days. Now this is very bewildering in trying to fully understand what was going on back then, and even far more be bewildering in what we make of this term, Antichrist, today. At any rate, what seems clear from the scriptures is that anti-Christian forces will manifest themselves in their relentless opposition to Jesus and to his church. The true follower of Jesus has been, verse 20, anointed by the Holy One. Or we could, we could also say anointed by the Holy Spirit. And this results in a real change of heart and character and one of the key characteristics of that change of heart is the recognition that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, my Savior. He truly is the Son of God. John points out the negative in verses 22 and 23. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Well, that's the negative, of course. But here's the positive. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. This is a very, very strong statement. Everything depends on what a person believes about Jesus. If an individual does not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was and is the Christ, God's own Son, sent from the Father, God in the flesh, then he or she is literally against Christ, anti-Christ. The quote, anti-Christ, or we can call them anti-Messiah even, movements, are bound to deny who this Jesus really is, the Son of God, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. You see, the trouble is that many of these movements that have come against the church throughout church history are very subtle and sometimes really hard to detect. They sound and look good, but they are not totally the real thing. There were 
some false teachers in those early days who held that there was a divine Jesus Christ. And that happened when, when the Holy Spirit came on the man Jesus at his baptism. But they also believed that that spirit left him before the crucifixion. Because after all, how can God die on a cross? So the church had to and has to be on guard. Especially, John says, to be on the watch against those who would infiltrate its own ranks and yet who deny either the full humanity of Jesus or the full deity of Jesus. And it's interesting to me that church history has proven that the greatest danger to the church has not been persecution from outside its walls, but attacks from within. And it is always an attack on biblical truth. Conclusion, simply, we must, we must immerse ourselves in the truth of the Word, of the Bible, of biblical truth, good, strong, orthodox Christianity. Verses 24 and 25. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. Well, that is the teachings about Jesus, the gospel message that God loves the world, that, unfortunately, the world is soaked in sin and death, and that through us repenting of our sin, believing in Jesus, inviting him into our lives, asking for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel message. Being assured of eternal life. That's what we need to soak ourselves in. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us. And this is wonderful. Eternal life. And so we come full circle here. We end where we started today. Verse 15. Do not love the world. Verse 17. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Verse 18. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. John's encouraging us, don't love the world because it's passing away. And on the other hand, those who hold on to faith in Jesus don't have to worry about that because they have eternal life, as it were, another world in heaven. How do we tie all this together? Now that's the challenge of holding many themes from the Bible all at the same time. For many generations of Christians have supposed that we are to renounce the world in any and every sense, natural pleasures, food and drink, even the beauty of the created order, because after all, it's all gonna pass away. We're just, as it were, passing through. Some Christians have even thought that the world is actually evil. We should live as if we were purely spiritual instead. But I don't think that's what John has in mind. The world here, and the Apostle Paul used the, the word flesh, basically meaning the same thing, means the world as it places itself over against God. The world is God's amazing good creation and as such is to be enjoyed and with thanksgiving and with delight. We are so blessed to live in this time, in this place, with all of God's goodness to enjoy. As I mentioned a couple of Sundays back, one of the dangers of John's day was a teaching called Gnosticism, meaning knowledge is good, the physical realm is bad. And it manifested itself in a thing called dualism. The idea that purely spiritual things are good 
and creation, physical things, are bad. That is not what John is getting at. Dualism, you see, paves the way for people to deny that Jesus can truly be God's only Son, fully man and fully God. And denying that, of course, is actually a major heresy that the church had to deal with. So when John says, do not love the world, it doesn't refer to the things, the, the physical stuff of the world, but to the world as it is in rebellion against God. And again, verse 16 is very helpful because it pointed out that there's a combination of things that draw us away from, from God, the flesh, the eyes, and even life itself, which eventually can become idols, other gods, that demand more and more from a person. Our world is soaked in this kind of reality where money, power, can become gods in themselves, where everything else doesn't matter. When this happens, a person is drawn away into a lie, just like Adam and Eve faced in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say, go ahead, do what you want, feed your appetites, do whatever you want at any cost, go after the lust of the eyes. You're worth it. It's all about you. And there's nothing new here, folks. It is the liar's same old tricks. But God has equipped you and me with another way of living, all because of Jesus. Through the word of God and through the anointing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Word and spirit, spirit and word. Let's call out to God for help in the battle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of your goodness. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are, the Son of God, the Messiah, sent from God to save us. Lord, help us to be a people of word and spirit, spirit and word. Fill us once again with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Immerse us, Lord, in the truth of the Word of God. Protect us, O Lord. Put a hedge of protection upon us, upon our families, that we might be a people that are committed to Jesus in all things. We bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life but above all, in your immeasurable love, in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such awareness of your mercies, that with a truly thankful heart, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, 
by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Thank you again for joining us today on our online service. We draw your attention to our website and you can check out what's happening at St. Hilda's. We pray that God would richly bless this week.